Matt Jennings is here. We haven't talked in like a month. I think the last time we talked was before the Georgia game, and we were pretty optimistic. And, well, that that went a certain way. And Georgia people are still commenting on that video. Like, guys, you won by 58 points. Get over yourselves. Anyway, we're going to talk again now. It's Locked on Horn Frogs. <laughs> You are Locked On Horn Frogs, your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. It is Locked On Horn Frogs. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or subscribe wherever you get your podcast. I'm going to kind of derail the show immediately, which is always a, a fun thing to do. But somebody just texted me, and I, I tweeted about this tonight. Matt, um, I get the impression you're not on Twitter as much as you used to be. Is that a factual statement? Not lately, no. Okay. Do you you kind of just reserve it for football season now? That's generally it, because it, I find my blood pressure rises a lot when I'm on social mm-hmm. media, um, yeah. not unique to Twitter. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I get on during football season for the memes and for the jokes and to interact with my great friends like you. And, mm-hmm. uh, and then at once, once football season wraps up, I kind of, I kind of peace out. So um, somebody, there was a tweet tonight that was like, do you listen to your friend's podcast? And I didn't really comment on that. I just basically said, there are friends of mine that tell me they listen, which is very kind of them to do. But when they say that, I immediately like get anxiety because I just start thinking about like, what have I said recently and how would they take any of those things? Um, but somebody like, as we were doing the intro, a friend of mine texted me that like this lady he works with, he found out that she's a TCU fan. And so apparently she's like a, a religious listener, which is a very, which is a very nice thing. Um, but it just, it, it made me think about that because like uh, one of my buddies from college, uh, Michael Zeiser, he recently told me, or I guess probably like a month ago, he told me that he listens and he's like a medical doctor now. Like I think he works in the ER somewhere. And so it, it was just funny to me to think about him like, checking out people's kidneys or whatever, and then putting in his AirPods and listening to me talk about three, three, five defenses and what he like, what he thinks <laughs> about that. Or I, I, th- I feel like my, my, our, our, our friend Tanner Thomas, I think he might listen. Cause sometimes he like interacts with some of my social media posts mm-hmm. and Tanner's like, like, a, I think he's like a basketball coach. I think he's like an actual basketball coach. Yeah. He's like a high school basketball coach. Yeah, and he's got a really sharp basketball mind, and so sometimes I'm like, I wonder if he listens to me talk about like pick and roll, and it's just like you don't like you have this, no idea what you're talking about. Idiot. This, is, this is so wrong. You you don't know any of that. But yeah, he and, and Eric Calzada sometimes chimes in on Twitter. A lovely people. There's a the whole yeah. group that Matt lived with, Marilio. They're just like salt of the earth, best best people in the world. Shout Mary out Tanner's wife. Go ahead. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It, uh, um, incredible people. Shout out, yes, Tanner and Megan and Eric and and, and Marilio. Um, also, shout out to Eric and Marilio, who were the people who went to the national championship game with my parents when, oh, um, and they had a really really fun time until kickoff. The game started. <laughs> Um, right. and, uh, cause I, at the time had a two month old who is now a three month old, like it was just, uh, or, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, three and a half month old now, um, was not in the cards to fly out to LA on short notice, um, when, and, and be out there because of hotel stays and airfare, um, probably be out there for like three and a half days, uh, right. was never going to fly. And so, um, but my mom had already gotten, uh, she, she had already was like, I'm, if I can put in for up to four tickets, I'm going to do it. And so then she, uh, and so Eric and Marilla were like, yeah, yeah, let's go, let's go. And, um, I'm glad that they got to go and see LA and see SoFi stadium. Um, I'm not sad that I was not with them. Sure. That is, that is great. Uh, I've, I've bummed tickets off Matt's parents before too. They're, they're just the best. They yeah, love to go to sporting events. They, they do. love That's to like take their, my friends to sporting events. Their empty nester retired thing. 
is going to all these sporting events. And Eric got married recently too, right? Is that mm-hmm. is that factual? Okay. I believe so. Right. Well, if you're still listening to the podcast five minutes in, or we just recounted some of our friends from college, uh, this is Locked on Horn Frogs. And I have Matt here to talk about the off season in TCU football and all the things that come with that. And so, and maybe uh, some of our friends will listen and, to this yeah, podcast. Maybe, maybe some of these friends will listen to the podcast and they enjoyed these shout outs. I don't know. Or maybe they're like, no, thank you. Uh, but anywho, Chandler Morris, let's talk about him for a second because I, I chatted with uh, Alex Frank today and I'm a TCU fan corner segment about Chandler Morris and this new era of TCU football. Um, and it's weird because I was talking about him today and I don't think I really was thinking about him in the lens of the Kendall Bryles offense because part of me still thinks like, okay, this is this is a Sonny Dyke sled team. He has a clear philosophy on that side of the football. And so we're going to see a lot of the same concepts that we did last year. But I think based on some of the quarterbacks they've offered since Kendall has arrived, they obviously have a pretty clear type that they're going for. And it's more of a dual threat athlete type. Um, but I guess just in general, Matt, when, when you think of Chandler, what you've seen of him in games, what we've heard about him in practice, what do you think he can do well or maybe differently than Max um, when he takes over as a signal caller here in 2023? I think the thing with Chandler, I mean, there's, there's a reason he won the job coming out of fall camp in 2022. Um, he brings – accuracy and um and timing and throwing into windows those were the things that were the things that kind of elevated his game relative to max that made him the starter to to begin the season right and so having someone who can do a little bit more of that precision passing game uh i think will be will be helpful again max grew in that regard so much um in the lead up to and over the course of last season. So, um, uh, but, but that's just like more Chandler's MO. Well, that's fine. I, that to your, it is a weird fit. It's a really weird fit. And it's one of those things where it's like, I, I do wonder if Sam Jackson had like stuck around for like an extra, like five mm. days, yeah. like how different would this conversation <laughs> be? But he was like really itching to get out the door and go to Cal. And I really honestly like, among the most fun players to watch in uh, that I've seen over the last, in a very s- small sample size, but sure. so fun to watch and, and absolutely wishing the best at Cal and, and that things go really, really well for him there. Um, I think he, a, a quarterback like him is a much better fit in terms of what Kendall Bryles has shown that he wants to do the kind of player that he recruits and the kind of player that he has tried to develop a quarterback over his last few stops, you know, at, at uh, Arkansas and, and Houston and Florida State and FAU. Chandler's not that. Chandler has the ability to improvise and the ability, the ability to scramble, and but he is not. You're not going to use a whole lot of designed run stuff. You're not going to do inverted veer stuff with him probably like you would have done with uh, Max Duggan or with uh, KJ Jefferson. or, or uh, That's not his thing. And the precision passing, to get back to the original point, that's not really what this offense calls for. The, 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 the point of this offense in a way is to create spacing that is, that stretches the defense to a degree that they're, that the quarterback is throwing to wide open windows and to, and to create coverage busts and to throw vertically, which Chandler can throw vertically, but like you're not really utilizing the things that separate him maybe from other quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. And so I, it does make me think of, um, I, this is not a secret, but it, it it does make me believe that they they'll probably be shopping around in sure. the portal after spring ball what they can find. Now, if they land anybody, I don't know. Um, but it, it's just a weird dynamic, and it's a it, it you know it's you get to bring a new OC, and it's always an interesting. There's always a degree of like it's an arranged marriage because he didn't recruit the guys but he's going to do the best he can to make do with the person he has on hand i think chandler can be successful in this offense but it's going to look different um than it would have a year ago if he can stay healthy which is another like very real thing to we have to be aware of which is that chandler morris has started um three games in a tcu uniform and he has made it to the end of one of them Mm -hmm. um 
I, that's probably not fair. Uh, I don't think an injury prone label is, is necessarily fair, fair to put on a, on a player. He's a small dude. If they're going to ask him to do any sort of legitimate running the ball, um, his durability over the course of the season is going to be a question. And we're going to enter Josh Hoover season very quickly. Uh, depend if, if there's not an acquisition in the portal. I feel bad for Josh Hoover. We really don't know that much about him. I, I know he put up really good numbers at Rockwell Heath. He wasn't like a super highly recruited player from the standpoint of like blue bloods weren't chasing after him, that type of thing. I think his his best offer before he ended up at CCU when Sonny Dykes switched over was, was Indiana. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's an issue. I, I think one fascinating thing about the injury thing too is uh, with Chandler, in regards to Chandler, the injury this year was kind of a freak thing. Like I think he was just like he was trying to change direction, twitch his knee, and I don't really know how long his timetable was. Like I, that's just a, a a thing I would like to find out because Max like tore it up in the Tarleton and SMU games, and it was sort of like, well, I mean, I guess he's the guy for now, and it's his job until he messes it up. So we didn't hear as much about like what Chandler's status was. Um, but yeah, it's, it is fascinating. Um, and you sort of touched on it, but I guess, is that a fair concern to have how much as a coaching staff do you, is, is this like fan hysteria or do you think the coaching staff is mulling it over? I imagine they're going to bring someone in regardless. I just don't know if the conversation in the coaching room is like, we need somebody because this guy is, hasn't made it through you know, a complete game except for one time in his career so far. I don't think the injury th- – that's and that's a good question. I don't think the injury thing plays into the calculus of bringing in and going, going into the portal. I think right. what goes into that decision-making is a need for depth because you've got two, two scholarship quarterbacks, um, one of whom has never played a snap in college. So mm-hmm. you just need the depth. Um, and then I do think that whoever they go after in the portal – Kendall Browse will, will be looking for someone who is more of a fit or not even a fit, but just like more in the mold that he clearly favors. Right. Um, yeah. So that's, that's what I would anticipate happening. Um, we were, you and I were <laughs> very much all on the, uh, uh, the Chandler Morris hype train uh, heading into last season. Yes. I think he is absolutely has, um, the ability to perform well um, in this offense with this collection of skill talent. Um, there's absolutely a, a, a version of the season that plays out where he he lights it up and puts some great numbers, and we're talking about him in glowing terms at the end of the year. Um, but these are the conversations, again, that you you are inevitably going to have when you have two scholarship quarterbacks on the roster and the guy calling the plays did not recruit either of the quarterbacks who are on the roster, right? Um, and then I guess that is a question that I'd be curious to ask you is, like, who do you think – I keep hearing a Hudson Card's name thrown out, which I, I'm i sure is a possibility, but do you have any, like, not necessarily a read, but, a, but an opinion on who you think is a fit among the folks who are in the portal right now or who you think they might go after yeah, that's a great question. I haven't paid a ton of attention to like when the dust settled, who is still left. Um, I mean, there's there's plenty of guys who are, are probably going to lose a job and will be available. Right. It'll be another wave. Ball. Yeah, there'll be another wave of guys um, that that go in. You know, one name that I heard too, and I, I'm trying to like Google quickly and see what his status is. Malik Hornsby is a player that was at Arkansas. He's a Texas kid. He's from Fort Mint Marshall. Um, and he's definitely sort of in the mold of, of KJ Jefferson. Now he's not like, he's not the size of KJ, but he's a dual threat and he was in the portal. Um, so that's a name that comes to mind, but I don't like, there's not, I mean, yeah, Hudson card. It would make sense, and it would be a veteran presence there. But it's like, from his perspective, you know, I guess if he's still sitting there closer to the city, then he'll eventually have to go somwhere. But I just – I imagine he's he wants to start. Like, he, you know, the reason he's leaving is because he wants to start somewhere. He doesn't just want to be clipboard guy and, you know, break, break glass in case of emergency. 
um, if Chandler Morris goes down. So I don't have a great read on who they would target, uh, but I think there will be, you know, another wave of, of players that are in the portal in the next few months. Speaking of transfers, so offensively, uh, I mean, this might just be their new philosophy, and I, I'm fine with it. I'm cool with it. But it seems like they're really trying to up the blue chip ratio on this roster through the portal with some guys that washed out or just didn't really click with their former schools. So we got JoJo Earl from Alabama, John Paul Richards in Oklahoma State, uh, Jack Besh, Tommy Brockermeyer, Trey Sanders are some names to know. Who is the most intriguing or, I guess, your favorite player on the offensive side of the ball that they added uh, through the portal this offseason so far? To me, in terms of I, – I'm thinking a little bit in terms of upside, but I, I air toward Brockmeyer because mm-hmm. obviously didn't see the field a ton at Alabama, dealt with injuries. But to get a top, depending on where you look, top two or a top five recruit in the country um, at one point uh, and a local guy um, and get him to shore up – a position for you at tackle that has been a problem for a few years now um, is huge. Now he's got to stay healthy. He's got to make good on the potential that everyone was so high on coming out of high school. But that's one that stands out to me um, in particular. And then I think I would go with, um, and then I think I would go with jo- Jojo Earl, a guy who you came really close to landing out of, mm-hmm. out of college. Like this is so Sonny Dykes' mo, right? Is um, it, with him, with Earl, with Brocker Meyer, and some of these other guys, DFW guys. He was doing this at SMU. DFW guys who maybe are looking for more playing time or had some injury, tough luck um, at one stop, and say, hey. Come back home, play close to home, get to play at a at a team that's with a team that's competitive. Get your draft stock up, get playing time, and and of course now he can sell. Um, you know, hey, we can compete for Big Twelve titles. We can compete for playoff spots. We can can we can get to the national championship game. Like he he has this proof of a concept that he can sell to transfers and to recruits, um, and get that blue chip ratio up and 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 increase the total. Uh, composite level of talent on the roster. I, I I am interested to your point on like this being like what they do, right? Is this a stopgap solution or is this going to be the norm? Like is the goal yeah. here, use this to get your talent, your overall talent of your roster up to a certain level while you build up the recruiting over the course of a few years. And then you balance it out later and recruiting becomes a bigger source of that blue chip talent long-term and you rely less on the portal later. Or is the goal always going to be, we're going to mine the portal for best players available and we're just going to figure it out roster wise Mm -hmm. later. Um, And that might be what they're planning on doing as well, but I will be curious to see what they do long-term because the former option was never an option at SMU. Like, there's just a hard ceiling on what you could do recruiting wise at SMU. TCU, yes. I think that ceiling is higher. And so, the ability to get that talent in the door right out of high school, the ability to do that is more likely um, uh, at, at a place like TCU, especially with the season you just put together. It definitely is, um, and that's a that is a great conversation because if you if you keep pulling in like top twenty high school classes, you're you're still wanting to acquire talent through the portal. But is there a need to like restock um, at the level they did this year? I don't know. We'll we'll see. But he's done a really good like they've done a really good job. Last year it wasn't as many heralded names, but like you can go down the list of guys that were perfect for the role they ended up in or the position they ended up in. Um, so hopefully they have, can have that same success or replicate that success this season. I want to switch over to defense for do that, though. I do want to talk briefly about our good friends at Built Bar. Built Bar is the best protein bar on the planet. Yeah, I said it. I'm making big proclamations today. That's what we're doing. I'm loving this off-season pod, and I'm ready to go after all the other protein bars around and tell them that Built Bar leaves them in the dust. I have eat it for breakfast. If you're somebody who's like, I want to be healthier this year, and you say, oh, no. It's February 24th. 
and I haven't done anything good in the health department, will start eating built bars and maybe cut out soda or something like I should. But start eating built bars and you can check that off the list because they're good for you and they don't taste like, you know, garbage, other health foods where you're like, this is not real chocolate. This is not real sugar. No, there's some of that stuff in there because it's Built Bar and it's wonderful. And that's what they're trying to do. It's online at BuiltBar.com. You can use the promo code LOCKEDON for a discount. Or you can go to your local Sam's Club. If you uh, are real bougie and have a membership to Sam's, you can buy Built Bar live and in person and check it out. BuiltBar.com slash LOCKEDON. Best live read I've ever done. Book it. Save that one. Proud sponsor of the Lockdown Network. Love it. You love Very it. Okay. Nice. Defense time. So Joe Gillespie, I think this will be a fascinating year for him because last season, I think our expectations going into the year were, can the defense have a pulse? Like, does the defense have a pulse? Could they get a stop? Could they put together a few good possessions each game that will give this, chance, this team a chance to win? Um, they exceeded that for the most part. And so now you have a lot of returners. And, I mean, you kind of look up and down that part of the roster and you say, okay, you lost some of the secondary, but you did a pretty good job of backfilling that with uh, some transfer players at corner. You have all your, pretty much all your safeties coming back. Um, you can sort of mix and match at linebacker. Yeah, I think you have a good mix of talent coming in or talent returning slash guys that were really productive last year. Uh, defensive line is a little more of a mystery. But – Matt, could this like could this be especially at the start of the year the strength of this football team as as odd as that kind of sounds, knowing what we know about Sonny Dykes and, and his history? I I absolutely think that's the case because to your point, there's well there's just less turnover. That's part of it, and you're getting key players back at a few positions. Like linebacker depth was a serious issue for you last year, um, provided folks stay healthy. If you get back. Um, uh, Terrence Cook and and Marcel Brooks and mm-hmm. and you're bringing in your and you're already bringing back Jamoy Hodge and Johnny Hodges, uh, Chad Banks, who were all uh, key contributors. You're bringing in um a few other. Uh, you're bringing in some some recruits that you're excited about that position. Like suddenly that looks like a position of strength. On top of yes, a secondary that, with the exception of Trey Tomlinson, brings back pretty much everybody. Right, um, mm-hmm. Josh Newton really acquitted himself well. I was really worried about him early on in the season, and I think he grew and got better over the course of the year. We all, you know, we all know how we feel about Bud Clark. Very excited about him and his future as a as um, as a TCU safety. Um, so just in excited about that group on the whole, and I think that was the thing. Not just not just Bud Clark, not just Josh Newton. Just seeing those, not just individual players, but them as a unit grow over the course of the year. Like I made a lot of jokes about them being a lot of smoke and mirrors over the course of the first part of the year. As the season went on, you know, you look at the games against Texas and against Michigan. I know the Michigan final score is what it is, but they don't win that game without the defense making crucial stops, without them getting in the backfield all the time, but with them out, without them just completely shutting down the Michigan run game, which everyone talked about was was going to just run all over TCU, right? Mm-hmm. Things that they didn't think that TCU was going to be able to stop. And you're playing that way at the end of the year. You're finally kind of getting comfortable in this new scheme, which was very much a shift from the one you had before. Um, and so now you come in, you bring back most of those players with the exception of Trey Hodges Tomlinson, Dylan Horton, Terrell Cooper, pretty much everybody else is back and uh, and you're adding pieces to that. I feel really good about their ability to field a top 40, maybe even a top 25 defense um, in, in 23, you know, barring, you know, crazy injuries or anything like that. And if you can, to your point, have an offense that can kind of get its feet under it and feel good and, and have some level of consistency that gives you a pretty high floor um, in Big 12 play. Um, I think you mentioned the defensive line. My dream state for that defensive line, you, have, you lose Cooper, you lose Horton. It, you know, it's going to be tough, but like put the young guys out there. There's, a, there's a, ostensibly a starting defensive line for TCU. That's Dominic Williams at nose tackle, uh, Avion Carter at end, and Marcus Deal at the other tackle spot. And mm. that is – 
a wildly talented and huge front three that sets the tone for the rest of your defense and allows you to control the line of scrimmage to a degree that you haven't been able to do thus far. And I think was if you were to point to a weakness for them in the games where they struggled against Kansas State, against Georgia, um, that was it, right? The, inab- the inability to kind of hold the line. Um, and if you've got that much talent and athleticism and size there, um, that's something we could see this year, and that'd be a lot of fun. Man, that would be a lot of fun. If Carter and Deal are starting early in the season, then I think you've you've hit on something really good. Uh, and there might there will be some growing pains there, but I mean, Don Williams like was great really last good. year, really good last year for you know, especially for coming in and, and the circumstances around him uh, being a true freshman. Okay, so let me ask you this: I think the opener is just fascinating. Like, obviously, because of because of Coach Prime. Colorado coming in uh, to town, and I, they've turned over like their entire roster, so they're more talented. I am I am interested to see, and I say this knowing that TC brought in Willis Patrick, who was a Jackson State guy, but uh, Travis Hunter, I'm sure he'll be fine. Like he was, I think it's the top player in the nation that that cycle when they got Shout him. Shout out Gwinnett County, Collins Hill. Go ahead. Oh, is he a Gwinnett County kid? Sure is. Go ahead. There you go. <laughs> uh, Shadur Sanders is talented. I really like. He played in. He played taps football in high school. And before all you taps people start commenting, I know there's some good competition <laughs> there. I just, I'm, I'm just telling you. I think he played like in the lower, like an even lower division. Anyway, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna get in trouble talking about private schools. Like <laughs> people, get, people get real sensitive about that. Anyway, he played taps football and he's played in the SWAC. And so, uh, he'll just be. I'm curious to see him in a power five environment, what that looks like. But uh, I don't know. TCU's got a lot of new faces. I just, they're 17 and a half point favorites going into that game. Which, okay, like, yes, I saw that number. That number in February is the most made up number you could possibly have. But yes, continue. And it's going to come down. Like, it'll come down. And they, I mean, like that Colorado game, they won handily. And I guess you could argue they probably could have put up like they probably could have put up fifty on them that night if they put their foot on the gas. I think the final was like thirty eight thirteen, but it was seven six at halftime. So I don't know what kind of what are your fair expectations? I know it's a dumb conversation because we're in February, but do you have any thoughts besides that's just a silly game to start the season? It'll be kind of fun I, to see what they do. I love dumb conversations in February. They're my favorite kind. I think, as an aside. Folks should look at Colorado's schedule next year because it's wild. Because um, they're playing TCU, they're playing Nebraska. It's mm. yeah, they go heavy on, on the TV. Power Five schedule. They're going to be on TV a lot. People are going to yeah. watch them, which is what That's Dion true. wants, which is totally fine. Um, Dion Sanders in a parallel universe, TCU head coach. That's its own other conversation. <laughs> um, yeah, I. I know they they obviously turned over a lot of the roster. I think that game will be – it strikes me very much as a game where it'll be competitive and more competitive than people maybe expect. And I think it'll, it'll be an early test of TCU's mental toughness and how a lot of these new pieces are gelling. Because, again, the defense, I think they're going to be fine. Um, the offense, if they get out there and they're having some struggles and some glitches or some growing pains early, cause they've got so many new faces, new faces that haven't played together. And you find yourself in a situation like to your point, it was seven, six at halftime last year, but I was never, I don't think there was a TCU fan that was ever concerned during that game. Like they didn't score a point on offense in the first half. Shout out Darius Davis with a punt return touchdown in the first half. But like that game was never concerning. 7-6 game at halftime against like this Colorado team with this level of talent, at least in the starting 22, and this coaching staff that have shown themselves to be able to create some results. And like Sean Lewis gave up a G5 head coaching job to go be an OC for prime, right? Like yep. they've got coaches and they've got mm-hmm. players, right? So if you're in a one possession game against this team at halftime this year, that's a very, very different conversation. Is it a game that TCU could lose? Like, absolutely. There's a, there's a universe in which TCU loses this game, especially if 
Kendall Bryles offense taking some time to get off the ground. You, again, you got just a lot of new faces. You've got a whole new interior of your offensive line. 100%. Like, this could get ugly and weird. Um, so I do think they will be um, – there will be a need for them to come out fast and play with confidence and, you know, probably be a little ahead of schedule in terms of what you would want in order for that game to feel out of hand, like feel out of reach early. I think TCU is going to win – um, but it is a fascinating one to watch. I really, I need TCU to win that game because the narrative of you get to the college football playoff and you win your biggest game, your biggest game are, you know, in the last decade, certainly mm-hmm. against Michigan. And then you follow it up by laying an egg against Georgia who admittedly like death star, like unstoppable juggernaut right now, but just like not even competitive in that game. And then following it up by losing in your season opener, the following year context is everything that it's not a fair thing, but the narrative that will be put out there will be insufferable to listen to. So you need to just Mm. not allow it to even begin to form. Yeah. It wouldn't be good for the brand. That's for sure. Um, If, if you did that, but I don't know. I think like, I would be more worried if they were getting Colorado in week four. I, I feel pretty good about them getting the start of the season. But you're right. They're putting together an impressive coaching staff, and they need to because I don't say this as a criticism because he's not the only like he's not the only coach like this in the country. I think there's a lot that are. But Dion's a just vibes guy. And I, I just mean like I don't think Dion is sitting in the meeting on Tuesday really diving into the X's and O's as much as he is just trying to set the culture and make sure the guys have everything they need. And they're positive and they believe in themselves. Um, and there's a lot to be said about that. There's, I mean, there's not there's not a lot of guys that do that super well. And Dion proved that he could do that well at Jackson State. So there's 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 a talent there that he has for sure. Very much a CEO guy, very much a culture guy. And I think that's, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about this over the last few years. How like that's kind of becoming the norm for head coaches in college yep, football. It is. Because it's really, really hard to call plays on either side of the ball and manage your responsibilities, all the other responsibilities that come with being a head coach, and do and do both well. And as of now, like Gary was, one, Gary Patterson was one of the the last guys to be doing it, and he did it really well for a long time. And then it obviously like really cratered there toward the end. If you want to th- talk about like a, like a prominent example of someone who's still doing it and doing it well, like. The list is Lincoln Riley, and I don't know who's next on the list. Someone can tweet me and tell me like who all the good examples are. But you know, it's, it's yeah. I mean, really I don't, hard. I don't get, I don't get the impression Dabo's like, like Dabo seems like a CEO. I don't know, maybe yeah. And like there. that's, and that's the thing. There's a ton of value that comes with that. That's what Sonny mm-hmm. Dykes. That's what Sonny Dykes is doing now, right? Um, he gave mm-hmm. Garrett Riley the freedom to you know obviously he's got influence and he's got ideas on the offense but he's he's interested in building the program and the infrastructure and the culture and you know getting guys where they need to be and then doing game management on game day rather than being super focused on um you know installs and what their opening script is going to be and all of that right so it's it's like it no shade at all about uh at Dion for taking that approach because it's become a very common thing. It's become something that you can be, it's, it's almost more normal and you have a more of a track record of success for doing it. Um, and I think it's especially great when you then add great coaching talent around you that can handle the play calling duties. And again, Sean Lewis to add an editorial comment in here for a second. If, if Sean Lewis were going to say, hey, I don't want to be a G5 head coach anymore. I'd like to go be a P5 head coach. I'd like to be a P5 offensive coordinator. I'm fine with doing that. Um, I could point to a school in Fort Worth that wanted to run a variation of the Bryles offense and wanted a guy with co- quarterback coaching experience that would have, that uh, maybe could have, should have, would have hired him and could have avoided some controversy this offseason. Sorry. I, made it, I almost got made it through the whole podcast without making an editorial comment about that, but there we are. No, I mean that's that's very true. Um, that was a strange that was a strange thing about the the Kindle thing was if you're looking for someone in the Bryles coaching tree, there's obviously a lot of those guys that are running some 
some aspect or some portion of that offense that were not on staff at Baylor um, during those times. But, you know, Sonny, like Sonny obviously has a thing for those guys. I mean, Carlton Buckles is there, Kazadi. Um, apparently number two on the list was Jeff Levy this off season. So like, that's just, that's, those are the people that he looks at, uh, for better or worse. And, you know, schematically, I get it. Part of the reason he brought Garrett Riley to SMU, part of the reason he brought Red Lashley to SMU was Sonny Dykes clearly is like, I have quarterback development and passing concepts down. I'm not worried about that. Um, he's constantly looking for, it appears at least he's constantly looking for how can I iterate on and improve on the run game and the, and give us a personality as a football team where we're able to control the line of scrimmage and run between the tackles. Um, that's the thing that he's looking for. And so in every hire that he's made again, Riley Lashley, and now Bryles, he's looked at guys who could bring that to the table and Mm -hmm. Bryles absolutely does that. It's great. Um, and I will say this, and I said this on Twitter at the time, um, you know, I think it is a more based on the substance of the allegations against everybody involved. Kendall Bryles is a more legally, uh, from, from a, from a legal and a liability perspective, it is a more defensible hire than Kaz Kazadi, just because of the substance of the allegations against each one of them. Right. So that's fine. Is he worth that? It, 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 does he elevate you on offense that much that that sideshow and that message that you are sending is worth it? I would argue no. I have mm-hmm. not seen the results from him as an offensive coordinator that I feel like warrant that. I could be – we could all be proven very, very wrong this season. They got plenty of time on the roster. We'll find out. Yeah, they do. And, I mean, if, if the offense is not humming, then that's going to be, you know, the first target. Fair or unfair, because they also just have a lot of roster turnover. So it's possible you could slog through four or five games before they actually hit the ground running from a schematic standpoint. But, um, yeah, it's going to be fascinating to watch. Final thing for you, one, one thing that was a, a hallmark of the GP era in the Big 12 um, was just kind of these wild swings. They were never like an eight and four team. It was, it was always ten and two or eleven and one. You know, maybe fighting for college football playoff eligibility. Obviously, we saw that at its peak in 2014, 2015. Or it was fighting for bowl eligibility and hoping that they get six wins. And there was really no in between. So now, uh, obviously, you went it's like you were literally in the last game of the college football season last year. And so now you come back and have to follow that up. What's the realistic expectation for this group? And I mean, if 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 they end up like seven and five, is that oh no, let's let's hit a panic button and reevaluate where we are with this with this coaching staff because that would just be such a different. I mean, I think it's understandable in a lot of ways. But it would just be such a different season than last year. Yeah, I think twenty twenty three was always going to be a reset year because of all the experience and production you were losing, right? Mm-hmm. You're losing Quentin Johnson, Tay Barber, Darius Davis, Max Duggan, Steve Avila, Alana Lee, the, the, the whole thing, Trey Tomlinson, Dylan Hort. Like you just so many guys who have played so, especially on offense, who have played so many snaps and played so many snaps together. It was just, you are going to have a step back. That was always the case. They, and they, you combine that with the fact that they overachieved in 22, it's going to make that regression feel worse and be perceived as worse than maybe it actually is. Um, so, yeah, we're gonna, I think they're always going to take us back. I think they will take a step back this year. Um, seven-ish, eight-ish wins feels about right. But I feel like I say that every – off season. And then maybe I'm just like, maybe I'm just subconsciously hedging my bet every time. But I do think finding yourself in a situation where you're fighting for bowl eligibility at the end of the year, because of how they've raised the floor of the roster talent wise, I think that's just going to be really hard to end up in a situation where they're fighting for bowl eligibility at the end of the year. 
doesn't mean yeah. it can't happen, but it's going it's going to take um like a series of major failures to end up in that scenario. Whereas, um, you know, when that was happening late late term GP, it was you know one bounce here, one bounce there over the course of four or five games where. Um, you know, a couple of bounces go differently, and yeah, they do probably end up looking like an eight or nine, an eight or nine win team instead of a five or six win team. Um, I don't think that this roster has a depth problem or is going to be as volatile where that is a likelihood. So, um, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think you know, falling back to a seven eight win season, regroup, develop some young guys, and then you're you're regrouping with the goal of. 24 being your chance to uh, kind of push your way back into the conference title race. Um, that I think that's very reasonable. And I don't think there's any reason to panic if you're sitting there, um, you know, with, with five losses or six losses in 2023. Um, as long as those are not uh, a, a bunch of embarrassing losses, as long as you're, you're, you're competitive and you're showing development. This is me talking in February. I don't think I would be super concerned about it. You know, talk to me in November. Yeah, I think there's a – I mean, we'll see. I think there's a path, certainly with the first seven games on the schedule, for them to at least be like six and one. And then even with the tough final five games, I mean, you're talking about a pretty major collapse to not be hitting eight, hopefully nine wins. But he's the best. Matt Jennings, he's the best in the take business, and he's always – uh gracious enough to join us so thanks to him for being here thanks for listening to lockdown horn frogs i hope you all have a good weekend hopefully they beat hopefully frog basketball beats texas tech saturday that'd be a cool thing for them to do so that's my message to jamie dixon and company good night or good morning whenever you're listening i don't care